Right. All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, Mashan. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the students in Fairfax City, we're very humble and grateful that Mashan Taylor accepted our invitation to our show. Mashan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Claudio. No problem. The last <laughs> two years have been, you know, a weird period for everybody with the pandemic and uh, say people believe in the vaccine or not. But if you were a touring musician, a teacher in your case as well, you couldn't tour, you couldn't do that much. How how the COVID affected you, your your family, your your sanity, how you holding up? Man? <laughs> well, well, I was very lucky that <clears throat> I was continuing to work through the whole pandemic. Actually, yep. just like this, I was on I was on my computer uh you know five days a week and because i teach at nyu in yep. new york city and also the new school and uh we went immediately we went online to zoom right. so um so i was i was lucky that i was uh, you know at least making some money and also feeling like i was useful and um productive but <clears throat> it was very very stressful for sure it's you know it's it's not easy trying to educate or, um, you know, really get in depth on this little computer yeah. screen. Um, it, it It's limited in terms of um, uh, just social interaction. And, um, you know, it's nice to see people. It was nice to be involved with people. But at the same time, there wasn't that real physical, personal contact obviously so but i was grateful to to have the work my husband on the other hand you know who's in a band called government mule they're a working touring band and they normally are on the road six seven months out of the year and everything stopped for them and and that continued for you know almost two years really so yeah i mean luckily they're back they're back touring and and working um i'm back in person obviously this last year um at the university um <clears throat> so i'm okay i'm okay <laughs> you know i don't i don't think it's over you know um it's still pretty crazy out there and in new york city there are a lot of people that are still getting COVID and now we have the flu season. So yeah. a lot of my students are sick and, you know, it's, I'm still wearing a mask really? all day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, and I'm, I'm triple boosted. I have like, <laughs> I, know what you I have mean, all, I believe I have all the yeah. shots. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm like a pedigree dog. I have all my shots. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Many, it was, you know, Lucky that we are alive to begin with, Masha, number one, number, yeah. number two, many, many small clubs, small band kind of retire. They end up going back to school, get another job, because if you're a tour musician, there's no money coming in, you need to do something else to pay the bill, right? Yes, so it's, yeah. It's very difficult. You can get by a little bit, but uh, eventually, you know, something lasts two years. You need to do something yeah. else for a living, you know? Exactly, so exactly, you, yeah. So, you know, the big bands, the genesis of this world, the Pink Floyd, the Led Zeppelin, they don't have the problem because they have a lot of money, but that's the exactly. exception, that's the exception of the rule, not a majority. Exactly. Um, were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking guitar lesson or piano lesson? Or, or... Well, my mother, I was born in Japan. My yeah. mother is Japanese. Yeah. And um, so my mother's side of the family, yeah. everyone is a musician. My mother was a singer. Wow. My my grandfather was a classical pianist and a teacher at the University of Tokyo. He taught piano. He taught. Uh, he actually directed choirs. Uh, he taught vocal music. I actually have some of his his books that he published when he was in his teaching years. Um, my uh, one of my uncles was a saxophone player. My other uncle was a pianist and also a master tuner at the Yamaha Piano Factory. Um, wow. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, they're they're all long gone now. You know, unfortunately, they they've all been they've all passed. But um, my mother always had music on. My mother was always singing in the house. Um, my older sister also loved to sing, so. 
and she's nine years older than I am. So I remember her when she was in high school, she was singing in the high school choir and she was doing um, musicals at school. So I always saw and heard music and my father also loved music. So they were always playing, um, you know, records. You know, my mother came from the tradition of, of jazz and uh, big band music. That's what she loved. Yep. So um, those are some of my early influences. Good for you. What kind of music were you listening when you were like high school, like when you were 16, 17 or 15? What? Oh, well, yep. I took I took a big left turn, you know. Really? When, when, I, when I went to high school, you know, I, I heard all this jazz, um, you know, when I was growing up because of my mom. But uh, when I hit high school, it was the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, um, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, Joni Mitchell um a lot of rock and roll a lot of folk music yeah. a lot of pop music of the time um and of course you know i discovered boys and uh <laughs> and, so, and i started singing um in bands you know in my teenage years so at that time it was it was more you know kind of hippie music really <laughs> you were you were singing in uh, some this when you were 16, right? Is that correct? Oh, I started I started oh. as a singer songwriter oh. when I was like 13, 14. But I was in a band by the time I was 16. Yeah. 15, going, 16. Going to clubs? I mean, playing in going clubs? to clubs. Yeah, going to clubs. Um, yeah, I would you know, oh. I was tall. I'm five eight. So I'm t I'm taller than the average, you know, Japanese because I'm I'm a mix. Yeah. So um, so I was always tall. And when I was young, the drinking age was 18. So it was very different back then, you know. Um, so yeah, I was already singing in clubs. Man, you were exposed <laughs> to all the bad stuff before. All you the knew. bad stuff, really early. <laughs> so eventually, so you were getting paid a little bit of money or. Oh yeah, yeah. By the time I, by the time I turned eighteen, I. And in fact, it was the week I turned eighteen. I moved out of my parents' home. I bought myself a car. I got an apartment, um, and this was all from money that I was making from singing. My God, man. Yeah. So I and I was ready to leave home when I was sixteen, but my father said. I'll have you arrested if you if you leave this house. <laughs> yeah, I will, my son is nineteen, and I'm not ready to let him go. No, I'm, 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 I cannot. I was. Aww. Um. But so event right, like you were saying, right? You were eighteen, finished high school, and one again, you were making very good money. Mm -hmm. You know, and on the other hand, it wasn't any pressure from your your parents to say. Hey, go to school, man. Forget about music. The, the, the life of musicians is terrible, bad, and you are not going to make it. Uh, you know, no. you sleep during the day and you work, so I speak during the night, and it's mm -hmm. a bad life. Or not. It wasn't any pressure to school is the only way, or? No, I'm, I think, you know, my parents were, you know, unfortunately, it was my dad was an alcoholic. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. Um, and you know, there were a lot of a lot of troubles, you know, because uh -huh. of my father. So I think my mother and I think my parents were very distracted with their own lives, you know, with their yeah. own yeah. issues. And I think my mother's main, you know, concern was was we had a, a home and we had food on the table and to take care of us, you know. So, and my mother, you know, knew that I loved music from when I was very young and she loved mm -hmm. music. So, no, that I never had, you know, any opposition to what well, I wanted to do. Well, good for you, man. Yeah. In my case, I was a, a troublemaker, man. I was chasing girls and drinking beer when I was 18. And <laughs> my, my parents were very pissed off at me because I came from a family where academia was the only way. And I was oh, wow. moving other stupid stuff. That's what I ended up in this country. And uh, I changed when I came here. And I, looking back now, that was the best decision I ever made. If I had been a good kid there, I would have never come here. This radio, this wouldn't exist. 
I oh, wouldn't really? have been able to travel that much. I wouldn't be able to have been able to see that many bands. I have seen over, I think, fifteen hundred shows or something. That's amazing. Uh, and uh, talk to musicians. So I don't know what maybe it's destiny, Michelle. It's I don't know. I it's very difficult to connect the dots going forward, but it's very easy to connect the dots going backward. Going, going back. backward, it's a, yeah. things happen in my life that, and that was the best thing that happened to me. So I'm very lucky. That's I, amazing. I'm lucky yeah. So um, you play with, um, when you, in 1979, you, you moved to uh, uh, NYC, right? New York City, and then you end up getting a gig with uh, the legendary Glenn Miller Orchestra? Yeah, that was, um, that, that sort of came out of the band that I was working with in New Jersey, where I grew up, yeah. um, called Grover Margaret and Zazu Zaz. And that was a... That was an incredible uh, growing experience for me from the time I was 16, 17 to 19, 20, sort of that time period. And we were very successful in the, the New York tri-state area, as well as we, you know, developed to the point where we played um, the Spoleto Jazz Festival, the Newport Jazz Festival, um, and we were really starting to make a name for ourselves, yeah. but it was it was a funny period in music because the the late seventies, um, you know, disco and punk kind of came in to the scene. So it was a very it was a strange time musically. You know, our musical identity um, with that band was sort of a sort of a swing jazz fusion contemporary sound so it was it was very eclectic yep. so if you know uh manhattan transfer yeah, you yeah. know they were around around that same time so a lot of people put us in that particular category but we also did a lot of original material which was kind of jazz fusiony so it was sort of hard to pinpoint us and we were very close to getting a big record deal um around the end of the, the 70s but it didn't happen and we had been booked by an agent named willard alexander now willard alexander who's long gone he was a legendary agent for the big bands the jazz big bands so maynard ferguson um buddy rich uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, Count Basie, he booked all those legendary big bands. Wow. So when when I decided to to leave, you know, Zazu Zaz, the band that I was with, uh, it just so happened at that very moment, the Glenn Miller Orchestra was looking for a female vocalist. So our agent told me about it and he said, you should come and audition. And I did. And I got the gig, so I I, yeah, I did that gig for um, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, you know that band was was very big in Japan, um, and it, and it was big, and still there's a market for that style of music. Yeah. So we would we would play you know ballrooms, we would play um county fairs we would play uh college venues and you know there's a particular market for that kind of music so but it was a great experience in that um you know i learned how to to um function in that musical setting when you're in front of a 19 piece big band and, you know, it's a very particular kind of animal, so to say, because, you know, there's very specific arrangements when you're in a situation like that. So the, the arrangements are the same every night. They're playing the same charts. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's a director, there's a conductor um, who is leading the whole thing. And so I learned that relationship of working with a conductor um, and also, I just learned a lot about that particular style of jazz music and 
the feel learning how to swing and you know for any musicians that are listening to this there is and i'm sure you know what i mean as well there is a pot what we call a pocket to to the groove and a certain way to sort of sing within the context of that style it's very different than singing pop music or rock and roll yeah so um yeah, it was it was a great experience at that age for me. And it was, you know, I was traveling on a Greyhound bus with 19 guys. Um, and, you know, at that time, the buses were like a real Greyhound bus, not like a rock and roll high end tour bus, yeah. you know, so it, everybody would have their two seats. And that's what that was your world and all your possessions were, you know, stored in that little storage area of your two seats on the bus. And um, yeah, it was it was a trip. <laughs> My God, man. Wow. Look it was like going you. going back to the 1940s, you know. <laughs> and you weren't the only the only girl on the band, right? The only female. Yeah. yeah. Which which is, you know, also an experience. Oh, I don't want to I don't want to know what it was like. <laughs> and then, well, they went from there to Foreigner, right? You were the, the work choir director and backing vocalist as well, right? Yeah. yeah, I guess. I mean, you probably know more about my chronology than I, I do. I, you I, know, I, after, I, after after so many years, it, it's hard to keep track, you know, of, of, course, of yeah. what year was, you yeah. know, um, what gig. Yeah. Um, actually, no, you know what? Um, what came after that actually was me working as a production assistant on the Jackson Victory Tour. And that was a left Ooh. turn for me. That was a really interesting left turn for me because a friend of mine was working as a stage manager. And at the time I was you know, living in New York City because there was a period of time I was living in Los Angeles, but I was in the city and my friend Jed D. Philippus, he was working as a, a stage manager and at Giant Stadium. It's not called Giant Stadium anymore, but it's it's the stadium that's in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. Yep. And the Jackson Victory Tour was setting up for the show there. And they needed a production assistant for the week. And I wasn't working, so I went out there and I worked uh, with the production manager and at the end of the week, they said, well, do you want to go on the road and finish out the tour with us? And so I said, okay. So I worked for six months as a production assistant um, and I learned so much about the behind the scenes action that is happening on any big show like that. And at the time, this was 1984. So at the time, the Jackson Victory Tour was really one, one, if not the biggest stadium show at that time, biggest stadium show. So they had um, what they call a leapfrog production. So when one show was taking place in one town, they were already setting up the next show in the next town. And so there were two crews. So we were managing over 300, uh, over 300 man crew. And plus every, every show in the local towns, they would be hiring additional crew from that town because most of those venues were, were union, you know? So it was, it was a, a great experience. Um, I have friendships from that tour that I still have today. My really? best girlfriend. Yeah. yeah, my best girlfriend was a production assistant also and and we had a blast. So and you know, and here's, you know, here's the moral of the story in that, you know, I took that job as a production assistant. That wasn't really what I wanted to be doing, but my friend called me and it was a it just turned out to be a great opportunity and the production manager later ended up doing the Pat Benatar tour as a production manager. And he remembered that I was a singer and he called me to audition for Patty Benatar. Yeah. And I got the gig with Patty. Yeah, so you, yeah. so you never know. And I tell my students this, you never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. Yeah. And, and 
just stay open to possibilities because you never know where your life is going to lead you. Yeah, yeah, that was the seventh the hard way. That's uh, uh, a very good I, I love Pat Benatar. I love Blondie. Yeah. I like many. It was difficult because like like yourself, our Durga, Lorelai, Pat Benatar, Blondie, we, if you are a, a female and you're an attractive woman, people, males or tour managers of band will not take you seriously. So you, because we are in a, unfortunately, male dominated world, not just in music, in every, everywhere, everything, right? So Still, it, it, was yes. been, it, it was, it was very difficult. It was even harder for you, for you, all of you, female yeah, actors, I, right? I, trying to make I, it, right? In some ways, yes, but in other ways, no. I mean, sometimes, you know, back in the day, sometimes being female was an advantage. Yeah. You know, sometimes it could work out that way for, yes, of course, as you say, I think the world is still very male dominated, but I do think it's changed and it's changing and it's continuing to evolve. But um, I think as a woman in any business, I think you you just have to really be smart and you have to um, really know your stuff, whatever that is, whether it's music or whether it's computers or whether it's you know um, engineering, whatever it is, you have to be sometimes better than your male counterparts, right? You have to sometimes work harder. Yeah. Um, but um, I do think things have gotten better. Yeah. But the pay is not the same, right? So the two of us, right? You know, the same the same resume, the same background, the same thing. Uh, you will get paid probably 80 cents out of a dollar that will get paid to separate. Which is, it, that pissed me off because in my case, my mentality is very different. I was raised by seven women in my life. Oh, so wow. uh, my, my four sister with my mom and, and two ladies at home helping out. So my older sister, you know, showed me exactly what the world was. So I learned how to do pretty much everything on my own before yeah. I got married and so forth. So I buy, I have more uh, female mentality too. So I'm always um, trying to get out of my, out of my way to help female, to get immigrants like myself that came to this country and, and so on and so forth. I'm trying to do the right thing in life. And uh, so I, I know, I, you know, guys are, not all of them, but there are many. <laughs> it's no good. So, so it could be, it can be tough sometimes. It can yeah. Be tough, but you need it to be, like, you need to work extra hard, right? To, for, for so, sometimes. And also I have to say, it, yeah, but I have to say, um, you know, I'm, I, now that I'm teaching, you know, at NYU in the new school, it's unionized. So it doesn't matter if you're male or female. It's oh, it's okay. yeah. equal pay, which I'm very grateful for, you know. Right. Good, yeah. good for you. So tell yeah. me a little bit about the, the experience uh, touring with Pat Benatar. How was it? Oh, she's, she's a very nice person. And her husband, too. Is, they're very good people, right? Yeah, Neil. Yeah. 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 They're, they're wonderful. And I'm so... I'm I'm so happy for Patty that she finally got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Absolutely. You know, that just happened. And also, you know, she's working on a Broadway musical right. that's based on her her music and her life with Neil. Yeah. So that's happening. So I think, you know, she's she's probably gonna have a bit of a resurgence, you know. Yeah. I yeah, every time great. that I she tours, uh, I mean, you know, I go and see her with my son. Do you? Oh, that's great! Yeah, yeah. and Blondie too. I really like Blondie. Too. I she, lo I love Deborah Harry. She's great. Yeah, yeah. a little bit crazy, but they're good people. They're yeah, yeah. People. And then uh, after that, you did a little bit with uh, you tour in uh, the United States and Europe with George Benson in '87, right? Yeah, I did. Um, I did six months, I think, some somewhere around that as um, a background vocalist and a percussionist. So I played percussion. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, that was the gig. That was you know the it it was required of the background singer because um 
the woman who had the gig before me, Vicki Randall, she left to be in the house band. I think it was the Tonight Show. It was it was a big TV show at the time, late night TV. And she was a percussionist and a vocalist. So that was the required uh, gig to do both. So it was great. It was a blast. Good for you. Man. Where uh, always come to he said, I, I know it's difficult, right, for a musician to whether you you were married or not or or have a relationship, go on the road for three months, six months, or a year. It's very difficult for me. See, let me let me explain myself. So, I go to a gig, I pay, you know, they, they pay by the ticket. I I drink a beer or two. I get there at seven. I go home at ten. I go. You're going to be at work at 7 a.m. next morning, right? But yeah. from your end, I don't I, I don't know if the band, you know, the, the fly was late and there was an argument in the past, you know, if you, or you got, you didn't have a good night's sleep or your son is sick and you are 500 miles away. Yeah. I should have a gig and I expect to see a gig here. Yeah. And for you, for you guys' point of view, it's, it's very difficult, right? So... It's uh, go yeah, up and, yeah. and sometimes you don't know in what city you are. Um, you know, they, you put alarm because you need to catch another flight at 6 a.m. to go from whatever, Chicago yeah. to Boston or whatever, right? So it's, it's yeah, it, right? Well, I would say that most of the time when you're on the road, most of the time that you're spending is you're either traveling, yeah, you're, yeah. you know, checking in and out of hotels, um, you're going to sound check you're you know trying to find a good meal um and you're only on stage for what two hours you right. know yeah. um so most of your days are consumed with the, all of the other stuff you, just your daily you know things that you need to do to keep yourself healthy and um and keep moving you know because you're constantly in motion when you're on tour so yeah i mean everybody thinks it's such a glamorous life but um the glamour is the is just the time that you see on stage two hours a day glamorous two hours a day. <laughs> that's it that's it and the yeah. you know the rest of the time it's you know you're schlepping your stuff around and um but it you know when i when i was traveling a lot i was in my 20s and 30s um prim primarily yeah. And and you know, I had the energy and it was fun and and I got to see the world and I you know, I'm very grateful that I had that experience of um living out of my suitcase and being a free spirit and I you know, for a long time I was not married and um when I did get married um my I was married once before now and um that person also traveled a lot so that marriage was short-lived <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. but um but i ended up getting married again and i live with a, a wonderful musician as i i mentioned and he's on the road now so we you know i don't go on the road as much as i i did at one time but he does travel yeah. a lot but uh, you know i understand the life so it's it's okay it's a difficult life, and it's uh, it's not easy. And especially so, the older you get, it's you know it's it's a lot harder to be living out of your suitcase and schlepping around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard. It's hard work, man. And then you end up uh, joining Pink Floyd uh, as a backing vocalist on the Delicate Sound of Thunderwall. The first question: How did you end up getting that job to begin with? Yeah, a lot, you know, it's funny, I, I a lot of people ask me that question. And, yeah. and I recently just, you know, had an interview with someone. And um, he was so surprised at the story, but the story is really pretty um, amazing in that, again, going back to, you never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. So going back to Patty Benatar, the mix engineer, the front of house engineer who did the Pat Benatar tour I worked on, ended up doing the Delicate Sound of Thunder. And when he heard that David Gilmore was looking for 
a vocalist, a background vocalist. He put my name in the hat and I got a call. I got a call from, from the management. Um, I was living in Los Angeles at the time and David was um, putting some finishing, finishing touches on the record on Momentary Lapse of Reason. Yeah. And I met him. Um, and as I recall the story, um, it was Ocean Way Studios in Los Angeles. And I, I went there. I met David. We sat in the lounge at the studio and we just casually talked and he was you know so down to earth and so friendly and lovely and and at the end of the conversation he just said well do you want to go on the road and i said yeah <laughs> and that was oh, it God. that was it that was it I, I never had to sing for him i mean really? he just he just took the word of, of Buford Jones, and I will never forget Buford Jones, his name, and uh, who was a lovely man. And if he's out there, I'm sending love, Buford, because, you know, he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime yeah. by recommending me. It was an amazing opportunity. So, so I think uh, looking back, that changed your life, maybe sort of upside down, because you used to do a smaller gig, a smaller venue, less money, and now longer, a year, travel all over the world with big venues with a famous band, right? So Yes, yes. My God, Pink Floyd, well, like we said, talked before, my opinion on the top three bands in the in the history of music with Led Zeppelin and, and Genesis with Peter Gabriel. And uh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I heard that uh, David Gilmour is a very nice person. He's very nice. He's a real gentleman. Real, real, real life, right? Yes, he's he's a real gentleman. You know, he's, you know, obviously they're all very British, right? Yeah. So he has that very British, uh, genteel kind of way uh, about him. But he really is a just a nice guy. He is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I have nothing but good things to say about that whole experience. And you know, it, I was in my 20s when I when I had that time in my life, you know, it was a crazy time. It was the 80s. It, there was, you know, drugs, sex, rock and roll. It was all, all involved. All in, yeah. It was <laughs> it was wild. It was fun. It was wild. It was amazing. You know, I'm I'm very grateful to be a part of that rock and roll history, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully one day I will be able to um, interview um, him. I, I believe it or not, I have seen so many bands, so many shows in my life, but never have seen, you know, the Pink Floyd together, all of them, right? The Let's Separate, you know, all of them together. Yeah. Uh, the Genesis, Peter Gabriel, all of them together. I have seen them, you know, some individual members playing different bands. Mm -hmm. or, Playing on their own and so forth. Let's you know, but never together. So it's uh, it's a good for you, man. There was well, <laughs> well, a crazy time of the there. And you were with, with Rachel and Dorga as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Were there? No, no, no. I think Rachel was there before, or no? Or the the two of you joined sort of the same time? Yeah, the two of us were there from from the beginning. From the so beginning, we yeah. were when when the rehearsal started in Toronto, in um. August, I think it was August of 1987. Um, Rachel was there. She came in from London. She was a friend of uh, the engineer, James Guthrie, who who yeah. had worked on recording the record um, yeah. with David. And I, I think he still works with David quite a bit. But um, Rachel was a friend of his. Yeah. So she came in and I you know, came in from the States. Um, so it was just the two of us that started the tour. Yeah. And when we, and I forgot what the date was, but when we played Atlanta, they uh, decided to film that show. Yeah. And that's when uh, Durga and Lorelei and Roberta came in, Roberta Freeman. Yep. came in they were really supposed to they were just supposed to 
fill the stage because they wanted more visual up front and it was supposed to only be for the film really? and yes and when um that was over uh to be honest with you you know there was a bit of tension between rachel and i really and yeah and she didn't like me at all so there there it was a it was a bit of a strange relationship yeah. um i don't i don't know why i can't tell you um i haven't talked to rachel and uh, and actually no one has talked to rachel since then since 1988 89 something she's still alive we don't know we don't oh. know she, oh, well. we nobody oh. knows where she is oh. i would try to find her you um, can try. I mean, I mean, Nadurga, Scott, Gary, I mean, we've all talked yeah. about nobody knows where she disappeared to. No further argument that you because she's a, a great artist, an unbelievable voice. I mean, I don't know. Oh, I yeah. Don't, wonderful singer. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. yeah sometimes. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. singer. But but the but Durga told me that um, she heard Rachel got out of the music business and oh, she okay is working in some kind of animal rights organization or something that's what we know that's yeah. all we know but we don't know have any contact information nothing yeah. it's very it's very weird <laughs> she doesn't want to be found that way. i don't think she wants to be found i think yeah. i think she had enough of the music business yeah. so yeah so then so the uh, two of you and then how Durga came into the picture after that. Yeah, so after Atlanta, um, you know, Steve O'Rourke, the manager, and and David decided to add add a, another Durga. person. Yeah, and that and it turned out to be Durga. Yeah, and the three the three of you, of course, I have seen videos and DVDs. I have a my no, I don't. It's not here, but in the, another another floor. Um, have about I don't know, 70 between vinyl from let's I mean Pink Floyd. Wow. From from, from Europe, from Japanese, different version, Blu-ray. Wow. So the, the 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 vocal range of the three of you are very different. I mean yes. Kind of low, medium, and high if you wanna yes. say that way. Oh, the three absolutely. of you complement each other very well, right? So Oh thank you. Yeah, no, it's actually a really it's a great little demonstration, actually, because Rachel was an alto. Yeah. Durga is Durga's much more. I mean, even though she has an upper register, she's much more of a, a alto slash almost a contralto because she has yeah. a very deep. She has a very deep low voice, and I'm a high soprano. Yeah. You know yeah. that yeah. that is my range goes very very high, so yeah it's kind of it was a kind of an interesting vocal combination because we did actually work together well good for you and durga yeah. she's a tough lady so <laughs> she wouldn't she wouldn't put up with the two of you so she will be probably i don't remember but she should be in the middle so hey the two of you stay to my side don't argue you know i'm the boss here so don't yeah 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 <laughs> well i think That's the management I think Steve O'Rourke, you know, basically just said, deal with this. And, yeah. um, you know, and they put her in the middle. So That's it was nice. perfect. Oh, yeah. Cool. You know, she's, she's a tough lady. I don't want to, I don't want to mess uh, with her. No, I don't want to mess with her. <laughs> and then you, so you were, so you were there only a year, right? You ended up missing the, the Pulse tour, uh, the Division Bell tour, right? I got to ask you, what, what, if you don't mind asking, What's happened after the first year? Why you didn't go on? That's an opportunity for a lifetime. Easy for me to say, but I don't know what. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to look back and say, "Oh, well, right. what? Why didn't I? Why didn't I continue?" Yeah. But at the time when I came off the the uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder tour, I was offered a contract to be a lead singer with a with a band called Hiroshima. Hiroshima, they, yeah. they were signed to Epic Records. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. They had a, a three-year contract. Uh, I had a three-year contract with them. And I thought it was a good opportunity to step forward and be a lead singer. And um, I took a chance, you know, yeah. and 
when I look back now, yes, okay, maybe it was not a great decision, but at the time it felt like a, the right decision. And, sure. and, you know, I had to explore it. I had to explore yeah. that opportunity. Yeah, sometimes when you move for my world, from a company to another, somebody offer you, I don't know, 30% more, a three year deal on paper. So it's a lot more money on the table. So yeah, you, you need to go from company A to company B. You say, yeah, I will, I will jump it, right? Right. And so, That's you know, I, I, I ended up making a record with that band with Hiroshima and I toured with them on and off for three years. And, yeah. you know, and the, at the end of it, we parted ways, but, um, yeah. you know, it was worth exploring. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Have you been with, with Gilmour in touch with him? He was touring, what, three years ago, right? He did like 15 gigs here in the United well, States. It was actually, believe it or not, 2016, yeah. 20, 2016. Six and I, I did go see him in, oh, at, Madison, yeah. Yeah, at Madison Square Garden. That's right. He did a couple and of And I went backstage and I said hello. And it was so great to see yeah. him and see, um, you know, Guy and his family and um, Robbie Taylor, who is David Gils Gilmore's um guitar tech who was still yes. he's been working with david forever um and a, a bunch of guys that were you know on the crew and john karen was there and it was it was really fun it was so nice to say hello good for you yeah and Dorga, Dorga told me that you guys party so hard there <laughs> oh man like she told we me she could, i think she's writing a book or in the process of writing a book or halfway i don't remember what people tell me but uh you guys have so many crazy stories and we had a lot of fun we had a lot of fun it was the 80s it was you know we were young and crazy and yeah. it was yeah we we definitely partied good for you good for you I'm happy for you and um <laughs> and then um you know feel free to elaborate after that you've been working with um with pink swan right in uh in Italy, you mentioned. So at the time, so I gotta ask you. So you were from Pink Floyd, the real Pink Floyd, right? And then I'm quite sure because you know you were the lead in Buckley. There are a lot of Pink Floyd tribute band, right? Try well, to get I a hold of you. I suppose offer you opportunity, right? After after yeah. you know coming out of the tour with Pink Floyd, quite sure you got many phone calls for different bands to do X, Y, Z. So, right? so, I I did, and um. You know, to tell you the truth, I, I I have gotten a lot of calls over the years and I, I really avoided, I actually turned down lots of offers over the years to sing with these Pink Floyd tribute bands right. because I, I, for a long time, I just felt, you know, I sang with the real Pink Floyd. Why do I want to sing with a tribute band, you know? Right. Yeah. So I put it off. I said no for m many years. And then finally... Um, I don't know, it was like 2014, 20, I, I actually don't remember the first year, but Pink's one from Sicily contacted me and they, you know, found me on Facebook and, uh, and they just said, you know, please, we, we would love for you to come and sing with us. What will it take? And I just said, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy. And you know, I just, I put it off. I just put it off for a while mm -hmm. and they just kept writing me. And I just said, okay, okay, this is what I need <laughs> in order for me to get on a plane and come to Sicily and work with you. And, you know, I didn't think that they would, they would answer. And they said, okay, we're sending you a ticket. <laughs> oh man, was... you should have increased the price. You could have asked for more, you know, no I should ask for more. Yeah. Exactly. I should ask for more. But I, I that first trip, you know, of course, my husband thought that I was crazy. He thought you're getting on. You don't know who these people are. You're getting on a plane. You're going to Sicily. What are you doing? You know, um, but I had the best time. They're mm -hmm. lovely people. And, you know, the Italians, just like I'm sure 
in a lot of Latin cultures, you know, it's all about eating and, and drinking and having a good time. And, course, you know, yeah. I, I met everybody's families and, yeah, you know, going to, pe yeah. going to people's houses and having, a, having lunch here and having dinner there. And, you know, they're just so hospitable and wonderful. And um, yeah, so I've been going back almost every year, except the pandemic, you know, and you guys do that sort of just during the summer or so? Well, you know, because now I'm teaching at university, I um, the summers are usually the best time for me to do things like that. But I'm actually going to go in April. So they they asked me if I would come in April. And um, I said, OK, I'll I'll figure it out. I'll work it out. And okay. Scott is going to. So Scott and I are going in April to sing with to play with them. Wow. Yeah. And how many do you know how many gigs? I think, they I have think not we're, but yeah, usually I think, they do what 10, 20? No, no, no. We do only a handful of shows, you know. Oh, okay. So I think I think we're doing maybe maybe three shows, three theater shows. Because it's oh, winter. Okay. It'll be it'll be chilly there. Because all the summer shows that we do are outside, you know. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. fun. They're wonderful yeah, people. Yeah, they, they, they. I have seen so many tributes. Then, Brit Floyd is pretty good. Australian Pink Floyd, they're very good. But Brit yeah. Floyd, in my opinion, are, are the best. I, I yeah, they're not, very good. Yeah, unbelievable. They're very good. When yeah. I took my son, I told told my my boy. Um, I have seen Brit Floyd many times. The first time I told him, close your eyes, don't look at the stuff, and, <laughs> and you feel like you are in a Pink Floyd. I mean, they're so. So well done, very polished, and yes, it's very Elisa polished. Very good too. Oh yeah, yeah. A lady from, I think a Canadian lady, which is, she sings unbelievable. Yes, um, yes, I don't know her name, but I've heard her. Yeah, very good. She, she's very good, and uh, you know, before we move out of the Pink Floyd, you, so you're going to be in Chile, free to elaborate. You're going. I'm I'm going to your home country. I'm That's going right, to yeah. your home country. Yeah. I've never been. I've never yeah. been going going to Santiago. Yep. Uh, I leave on Wednesday. So um, yeah, um, I'm, you know, uh, Durga, uh, as you know, Durga is going to be there, Lorelai, Scott yes. and myself. So the four of us, uh, yeah. so it's, it's a nice little reunion for, for us. And, you know, I, I don't know anything about this band we're singing with. So I, um, I understand they're very good, though. So. And you guys are doing only one gig in Chile and then come back? They're not going to Argentina or... No. Or really? No, it's just one show in Chile. Actually, Durga is singing with another band from Argentina right now. She's been in Argentina. So she's been doing shows there already. You know, for Durga, this has really kind of become a career. You know where she's singing with a lot of different um pink floyd tribute bands so you know good for her she's you know figured out how to make it work for her and yeah. she does a lot of these shows yeah good, yeah good. yeah you would yeah. like going to buenos aires if you have the opportunity take another another day off go to buenos aires for the day you were i would love yeah. to i've never been i would love to i hear it's fantastic it is very nice yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, you won't you won't come back let me put it the other way <laughs> Well, and it's summer there. It's cold in New York right now. So of course, yeah. it's summertime there in, in, <laughs> in Latin America. So yeah. um, then you you have the opportunity to um, a couple of years later, some years later, play with Sting doing the uh, the brand new day uh, tour, brand new day. Yeah. and then yeah. uh, the two thousand to play yes. the tour, right. Yeah, the end of 99, 1999 and into two thousand. So yeah, I did um, some of that tour. Yeah, for about six months, I I was on the road with him. So that How was an experience. How is it to be playing with Sting? Unbelievable. He, he well, he is a very big rock star. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> he's yeah. a he's a big rock star, and um, you know, incredible songwriter. I love. I've always been a fan of his music and of course, yeah. love his songwriting, love his, his singing and playing. And, you know, he was playing bass uh, on that tour. So he was uh, working hard, you know. So it was a great band, you know, Manu Cachet. Yeah. Um, and, of course, Dominic Miller. He's been there f forever with Sting. Yeah. And um, Jason Rabella was playing piano. Yeah. Um, and Kipper... Um, 
and and my my coworker uh, Daryl Tooks was the other singer at the time. Yeah. So it was it was a great it was a great experience. Yeah. yeah. More uh, normal than Pink Floyd. More strict. More rigorous. More. Um. Very different, right? So. Different. Very different mentality. Very different mentality. You know, Sting is a. I would say that he is definitely a perfectionist. Really? Um, yeah, and and every day at soundcheck, he was always, you know, thinking about, well, how can we make this song better or do this differently? Or, you know, he was always thinking about how to um, perfect things, you know. So, yeah, it was very different. You know, David, his his style of being a band leader, he pretty much lets everybody kind of do their thing. You know, he doesn't yeah. he doesn't try to control what you're doing as an artist. You know, he appreciates he appreciates everyone's contribution musically. Right. Um, you know, for instance, when you know we were doing um, the delicate sound of thunder, and when it came time to sing "Great Gig in the Sky," you know, obviously that's an uh, iconic. It is it's an iconic vocal piece. Yeah. And and you know we all wanted to sing it, of course. Yeah. So you know David just said, figure it out. You know, split it up and figure it out. You know, he never told us what to do. Yeah. He never tried to control. You know what we were doing. He really respects everyone's musicianship and 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 expects everyone to be professionals. You know, which yeah. is fair. Yes. Yeah. So. Some other musicians are very strict right very yeah right yeah it's things and many others so yes um, exactly <laughs> right. and you were at the royal over hall correct on the Grammy yeah Oscar. that was yeah. an amazing that was an amazing show it's such a beautiful beautiful oh, yeah. venue yeah. beautiful yeah. venue and uh yeah we we did nine i think it was nine shows there sold yeah. out shows yeah. Yeah. yeah royal over hall is an unbelievable place right it, I've been it's lucky important. to go to London every year and um, um, been there several times already. And uh, yeah. yeah, who did you see there? So um, I this year in April, let me see. I went to U two to see the last three shows of Genesis before. Oh, wow. the wow! So there we go. And then at the Royal Albert Hall, I went in May. That I had tickets to see Eric Clapton. The the, the show where. Two years ago, they moved for they put it for a year. The COVID was still were around, so I went in May. I saw Eric Clapton twice. The night before, I saw Joe Bonamassa. Ah. So Joe Bonamassa, Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton, and then Brian Adams and came back. Came back here. Oh wow, that's great. I, my <laughs> wife think I'm crazy, but I have the best time <laughs> in my life. It's, it's a beautiful place, man. It I didn't really like it much. Eddie Clapton, I, I would have done things differently that he did. Uh huh. In Interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, does, by the way, I, does your wife go with you on these trips? Sometimes, sometimes. I go by myself with a friend, a friend. Sometimes the three of us with my song goes. But oh, my nice. wife like more Latin music. I like uh -huh. more rock and roll stuff. Yeah. And my son like more classic rock, like myself. So. Oh, that's great. That's great. But, but uh, oh, I love no. going to London. It's very expensive, but I have a great time. I, I couldn't sleep, man. I, you know, I went to the hotel <laughs> after that. And, yeah. I would have done, from a PR point of view, I would have done things differently. Than, than... Mm. See, it's a big difference. So, Sting, he's very professional. He wants his shows to be very polished. He will call your attention after the show. Hey, you started 10 seconds before you, you were right. singing. Or you should have sang for 30 and you end up singing 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. He's the right kind of thing. It's under structure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, Eric Clapton was very loose in my opinion. I mean, people fly all over the world to see Eric Clapton. Huh. Uh, not only to see Eric Clapton, but see Eric Clapton play at the Robert Hall, right? Yes, yeah. So yeah. They, if I had been you know, part of his management. The first scene when he came out on stage, I would have said something that hey, very, very happy you guys are here. I know that we postponed the stuff. 
for two years. Let's have the great, the best show of my life and so on. So I would have to say something like that, right? In yes. between every three tracks, he should have said, hey, this is Layla for 1979. When I was like, this, then we play for you guys this and that. He didn't do anything. At no. the end of the gig, right? Toward the end or twice on the gig, you need to introduce the member. On drums, we have Johnny on Oh, yeah, yeah. We had Mary, Peter, and then give you right. each of them give a, like a solo at, at least one minute. So he he didn't do a start up this well. So really, oh no. Well, 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 well and, I, and I recorded, so you know I was there twice. So maybe yeah. one day I wouldn't. Well, perhaps I would never be able to interview Eric Clapton, but one day I had the opportunity, and I I interview why, you know. Uh, one guy recently who was guitarist for him, and he he he's see when you when you are hungry, you don't do stuff like that. But when they have so much money, like the Pink Floyd guy, the Led Zeppelin guy, the Rolling Stone guys, Sting, there's you know, they have a hundred million dollar, two hundred million dollar bank. They they're not hungry. They don't care about the details anymore. You know what I mean? In well. My- I don't know if that's the case with everyone. I I yeah. I don't think that's the case with David Gilmore. I just yeah. think, you know, I think there is a cultural thing too. You know, the Brits are not I mean, not everybody is the same, of course. It's it's hard to generalize, but I think Dave, with David, he has a very British way about him and he's actually a fairly quiet kind of person, you know. Um you know, when I worked with Sting, he would talk to the audience. And in fact, he rehearsed his talk. <laughs> he rehearsed what he would say to the audience, exactly right. you yeah. know, and that was part of the show. Um, but, you know, I have to say, and, you know, since we're talking about Eric Clapton a little bit, I kind of got very um, upset with Eric um, during the pandemic because he was telling people, not to get the vaccine and he was he was saying it was a hoax and it was i don't know he said all kinds of misinformation right. and i think i think it really crosses the line of right. what a what a entertainer should be doing and right. should be telling people because you're you know you're in a very influential position absolutely right right and he, and he affected a lot of people um, by telling them not yeah. to get the vaccine and because yeah. he didn't get the vaccine, you know, yeah. he was an anti-vaxxer. Yeah. So yeah. it really, you know, actually my husband and I started jokingly saying, oh, Dr. Clapton. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, we're talking about Royal Waters. <laughs> get too much into politics as well. I, I, don't, I you no. know, people, people are going to see, people pay, I don't know, $300 to see Royal Water. To it's play you know, two and a half hours to see Pink Floyd. That, I don't want to know your political views or this or that. No, that's that's your own, man. You know. Yeah, right? I agree. I agree. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, especially during the show, you don't need to be doing it during the show. What yeah. you do outside in your personal life—that's a whole other story. You know. Yeah. No. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> that kind of crazy. Then do you end up uh, releasing a couple of records? The one in two or four. With the help of several musician and Grammy Award winner Rick the Puffy. And uh, yes. then you release another one in 2007. What was the motivation for you to? Well, I've been singing for all this great band at the same time, I, I have written several songs and I want to give it a try. Or, yeah, you know, I, I've been writing songs since I was a teenager songs, and, yeah. and playing and playing guitar and, and doing yeah. all of that. And and I just, my life went into the direction of being a background singer. And, you know, I'm very lucky and, and very happy with my successes, but I never really spent the time, um, you know, putting putting my own music out. And so after I had toured with Sting and and some things, ha- some things transpired during that time period, and I just said, okay, um, I am done with this and I want to pursue, you know, some music for myself. And, um, and at the time I was, and for many years, I've, I've loved Brazilian music. So, um, so those two records that I released 
are very um, Brazilian music influenced, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So it was, it was, you know, I'm glad that I did it. Yeah. Um, you well, know, it was just unfortunate that the, the two record labels that I signed with were very small labels. They didn't have the money to put into a lot of promotion and marketing and touring and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it didn't go very far, you know, but, yeah. but I still have those songs and I'm, and I'm, I love the, those songs and I'm happy they're, you know, still, um, in the world. And I'm actually been re-releasing some of that material. So, really? yeah. yeah. And then you've been with government Buell for a while, well, many years now, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, my husband, you know, as I mentioned, he's in the band, he is the keyboard player and he's, um, you know, very yeah. talented multi-instrumentalist. He plays guitar and trumpet and trombone and, yeah. Um, so he, you know, during the mule shows, he's switching instruments all the time. So he's, you know, he's a very active member. Um, so when, when government mule, um, calls for additional background vocals, you know, I'm very lucky they call me in. Um, also the bass player's wife is a singer. And so we've, we've done a lot of shows with them as background vocalists. Good so yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Feel free to elaborate in your teaching teaching career as well you've been doing that for a while right so yeah you know and that that was never in my life plan i never imagined myself teaching in a university um you know after the sting tour and after uh you know releasing my first solo record um and then the second solo record right sort of in that time period I decided, um, well, I, I had already been starting to teach privately, yep. but I had never gone to college. Wow. So I, at that time when I realized that, oh, I, I'm enjoying this teaching and, you know, I had students coming to my apartment in New York City and then my husband and I moved upstate New York and I have students coming to my house and I said, you know, if I want to take this further, I'm going to have to get my education. Yeah. So I went back to school and I got my bachelor's and I'm, and I'm in my fifties when I went back to school. So, um, I got my bachelor's. I was able to do my bachelor's degree in two and a half years. Um, because the, the state university of New York has a wonderful program where you can get credit for your life experience yeah. and of course it requires a lot of papers a lot of you know uh um writing um you have to put together a whole portfolio of basically proving you know what you think you know right. and um and then i had to you know take some of my gen ed studies and and all of that but i was able to get my bachelor's pretty quickly and then I went to NYU for my master's degree. Good so I it's never too late, people. <laughs> if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. And your parents, I don't know if your folks are alive, but they would have been very proud of you. Yeah, my my mom was still alive when I when I um you know was doing all of this. She thought it was crazy. My my siblings thought it was crazy too. They said, Why are you doing this at this time in your life? But I'm really happy I did. And it's what got me into being able to teach at NYU and the new school because yeah. I have my master's degree. And, you know, as you probably know, um, you know, now in academia, many times they're looking for a doctorate degree yeah. in order to teach. And it's, you know, it's become very, very competitive out there. So, That's but tough. but having my master's along with my, my resume, it really of helped. Of course. Yeah. You yeah, put, you know when you put pink from your resume, <laughs> a lot of door open for you, man. Of course, of course. Yes, of course. the doors yeah. opened easily. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, it's great. Looking back in your life, uh, would you know? Would you have done things differently, or you happy with the way that things turned out, or? I would say for the most part, I am very, very happy yep. with, with, you know, everything that happened. Are there some things I would have done over? Yeah, of course. 
Um, I think that's life, right? Yeah. We, we, we never, um, you know, there is no perfection in, yeah. in our life's journeys and our choices. Sometimes we all make um, choices that maybe we wish we didn't make. Yeah. Um, you know, in looking back, do I wish that I had stayed with Pink Floyd? Of course, yes, of yeah. course. Um, but I don't regret having the experience that I did when I, you know, went off to sing with Hiroshima and I had that three year stint with them, you know. Yeah. So, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So yeah. we we all have to sometimes make choices that in hindsight, maybe yeah. it would not be the choice to make, but I'm very, I feel very grateful for the way my life has turned out and I'm still going, um, you yeah. know, I'm here, I'm still going. So it's not over. <laughs> You're catching a flight in a couple of days, man. To go I'm to, catching, uh, that's to, uh, right. To go to a strange planet called Chile. Planet Chile. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. It's not over. So, um, you know, and more more to come, more to come. That's right. Feel free to elaborate on the uh, five over 40 competition. I saw something. Oh, <laughs> Everybody knows about that. <laughs> I, oh I, I prepare God. my interviews, man. I gotta prepare. How you research your life? <laughs> so that was a crazy little adventure. That you know, I, it's just you know, I'm sometimes impulsive. I have to admit, I am sometimes very impulsive, and I decide to do something, and I go. And and I saw that um, online, and you know, I and the the, the grand prize was. $40,000. I said, Oh, well, I could use $40,000. I mean, of course, you know, yeah. of course. And it was for a good cause. It was raising money for the National Breast Cancer Foundation. And I just said, Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I did. And, you know, I spent, I think, three, three and a half weeks or something involved in it. And then, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, I didn't make it to the next round, but it was fun. It was, you know, mm -hmm. It was it was a fun adventure for a minute. <laughs> you need to you need to be crazy. If you are normal, then you will not accomplish anything. In your of life. course, yeah. You know, you I'm gotta... like you. I'm I'm a believe it or not. I'm kind of weird. I'm a I'm an introvert, and now I'm calling people all over the world. Uh, I'm a risk no, taker. But... Yeah, I'm an immigrant. You... I'm a risk taker. I have done well myself because I'm because I'm a risk taker because I I'm hungry. I um. Me too, me too. You know, um, I grew up in a Catholic family. I believe that there are great people out there, bad people out there, but I try to do the right thing in my life. This, this country can be very good to me for being yeah. a, a, a C average student uh, who was kicked out of private school more than once. And my mom went <laughs> to talk to the priest and uh, no, let this guy come back. He's okay. He's <laughs> he doesn't mean what he did, or he, he doesn't mean what he's what he said, or whatever it was happening. <laughs> I, I, this country has been very good to me, and I'm 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 very lucky. So you know, to to be yeah. able to talk to people like you and um, buy the records and the, the amount of concert I'm able to see, uh, music has given me so much satisfaction. I don't know what it is, Michelle. I don't play any instrument. I don't know how to read music, but I I buy new. I don't know a lot of music every month and put a new vinyl and uh, put my headphone, drink a cup of beers and it transformed me. I mean, it, it you know, is, it's trans, it's thing. transformative. It's magical. Music is oh, magic. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. It's magic. And it's, it's music can be inspiring. It can be healing. It can absolutely. be motivating. It can be so many things right to all of us at different times in our lives. And, and yeah, I'm, it's medicine. I think it's really medicine in life. I really do. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wish, it's wonderful. Yeah. I wish this crazy guy called Putin, somebody can give him some records oh. for him to, I will, I will <laughs> do that. I will do for him to forget about the nonsense he's doing. And... Oh my God. He needs to, he needs to like, I don't know, take some psychedelics and listen to some Pink Floyd. Yeah, that's right. See a psychiatrist, man. There's crazy people in this world. There's a lot of good people in this world, but there's so many people that you say, how in the world are people alive like that? You know, it's just, 
I don't know, but you know, it's all a balance, right? It's, it's all, um, I guess, I guess in life there has to be those, you know, in Eastern philosophy, you know, they talk about the yin and the yang. Yes. So the black and the white, the opposite energies that, that need to be in the world to balance, you know, Yeah. everything. So I think there is a purpose for it all. Sometimes Yeah. I, I wonder, but um, there is a reason. There is a reason why he's here too. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I I think know. about like you know. If I never, if you, if you could have dinner. With any musician, any band, dead or alive, tomorrow night, who that will be? Oh my God. Dead or alive? Oh, Only one. only one. Yeah. Oh. Can be a band or can be, you know, a person. That's a hard question. Only one. Okay, two, three, no more. <laughs> um, I would love to sit down. Um, I would, yeah, even though I have met him, I have met him many years ago, but I would love to sit down um, and have dinner with Keith Richards and, and Really? Mick Okay. and, and, you know, just have an evening uh, with, a, with them and their families and whatever. But I just, he's such a character. Keith Richards is such a character. And I think, I think, I think Mick and Keith, and I think the Rolling Stones in general are just, you know, they're also a very important band in rock and roll music history. Um, and I find them really inspiring. They're still touring. That's right. They're still out there doing it. And, you know, isn't Mick 80 or something? Isn't he Yeah. close Yeah. Yeah. to Yeah. 80? They're close to eight years. So now it's I mean, it the just Rolling Stones goes guys. to, So yeah. yeah, it just goes to show you that you don't have to buy into the idea of getting old. You don't have to stop doing the things in life that make you happy, that fulfill you, that you can, you can keep going, you know, as if with the right attitude and yes, you have to take care of yourself physically and mentally, but you know, it's we're here to enjoy ourselves enjoy our lives and make the best of it Absolutely, absolutely. yeah so i find them very inspiring Yeah, yeah. yeah. you gotta keep on doing the same, man. And keep absolutely me positive. Keep me positive, my champ, because see if if I can go and see you play uh, with that, you know, with that band in in Italy in April oh or May pinks or one pinks yeah, with one Pink Floyd. I forgot the name yeah from it. Yeah, hopefully we can work out. I would like to take you out to dinner with. With Scott, Scott is a very nice guy too. I have we He's exchanged great. a couple of mail. We tried to work out a day because he Scott is doing a lot of other stuff outside music, Yes, so he, he's yes. very busy. So and uh, hopefully the three of us can get together and uh, have a That enjoy would be a couple, great. couple enjoy dinner or some Italian food, a beer, or whatever. That would be fantastic. That would be wonderful. Yeah. No, Already I'll, I'll, I'll send you the dates. I'll send you that's the right. dates in April. Yeah, it Yeah. was very nice talking to you. I'm looking at my time there. It was very nice. Good luck to you in Chile. Enjoy yourself, Thank have fun, you. and, uh, you know, come back safe and uh, keep me posted. Then. Thank you. I will. I'll report in, let you know Oh, how yeah. it goes in You Santiago. bet. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. you Have so a great much. day. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>